I became interested in this problem really as a uh, medical student and medical resident. And uh, when I began my research career soon after my residency was over, I thought, gee, this is an interesting idea to test. Is it right or wrong? And I thought about the, the development of pharmacology. And for many centuries, doctors would use drugs because they thought it was a neat idea to use this or that. And nobody really did studies of whether that drug worked. And it was really only after World War II that it became routine to do randomized controlled trials of drugs. And then I realized that we do a lot in health policy that is kind of like pharmacology was uh, 200 years ago. That is, somebody gets a good idea, says, I think everyone should do this. They do it and no one really evaluates if it works. So it became clear that if this idea of academic detailing, of marketing evidence to doctors from a nonprofit, evidence-based perspective, if that really worked, we ought to be able to show that it works in a randomized controlled trial, just like we would show that a new drug works by doing a randomized trial where some people get drug A and some people get drug B and you see how they do. So some of the earliest work involves setting up a nationwide study that involved 435 doctors and we randomly allocated them to either be offered this academic detailing service where somebody would come and sit with them in their office and give them the best evidence or to be controls where we would just trace their prescribing and in both cases it was done through the Medicaid programs in four different states. And at the end, we would see if there was an effect, it must have been because of the intervention, because it was a randomized trial of this new kind of approach. And sure enough, we, in a paper that was in the New England Journal of Medicine, actually a couple of papers that were in the New England Journal of Medicine, we were able to show that on a randomized trial basis, we could demonstrate that uh, doctors offered these programs improve their prescribing more than doctors who were controls. So where ALOSA came from was that as this work began to get published in journals and other groups began doing similar work and showing that it really did have good effectiveness, we began to get calls from places that said, hey, this seems like a neat idea. We would like to have an academic detailing program. And it became clear that the best way to do that would be through a nonprofit organization that would be able to be lean and mean and just focus on getting the work done as cost effectively as we could do it. And so we set up uh, a nonprofit and I named it Alosa after the genus of fish that swim upstream like salmon or herring because it felt like we were swimming upstream against the current of this uh, tsunami of uh, commercial drug information. And in fact, I have my tie has little salmon on it to reflect the swimming upstream aspect of what we do. And we created Alosa in 2004, and we've been receiving contracts, usually from government entities, that say that it is in the public's interest for the government to support a different voice in the doctor's office so that he or she can hear about people who are only beholden to the evidence and not on commission to try to increase sales of a product. And as the movement grew, uh, more and more entities came to us and said, can you do a program for us on this or that topic or any topic you like, just so we can have another voice in the marketplace of ideas for doctors to learn about drugs without any commercial influence.